Science faction is only for adults and children cool enough to leave an iTunes comment. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 241. Science Faction Algology. I got nothing. I'm going to be honest with you. A lot of these scientists weren't named with comedy uh-huh. names in mind. Yeah, like, I mean, you, but there's so many you could have done with that. You could have made an Al Borland joke, like it's the study of... of competent carpentry. Yeah, exactly, like that. Yes. Uh, no, algology is actually the study of algae. What's interesting is the study of algae actually has two formal names, either algology or phycology, which are both the same thing. Is one a maiden name? No, but like biology is pretty big and we got one word for it, right? Like, what do we need two words for this kind of obscure? science? Even among scientists, maybe algologists mm-hmm. are the least confrontational among all scientists. So they're right. like, well, I guess they'll just be two names because, I mean... I like the idea that even, like, algologists are the lowest rung among botanists. Like, there's just a bunch of bad boy botanists with leather jackets and motorcycles that are studying elm trees, and they're like, ah, oh, it's the algologists again. <laughs> Nerds! So it's the size and complexity of the species <laughs> yeah. you study. So if a scientist studies redwoods, you know mm-hmm. he's a big swing. Oh, yeah, 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 dude, oh, that guy's the Chris Helmsworth of botany. <laughs> okay, but isn't there a, the bunch of trees in Aspen that is one biological That's true, yeah, 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 yeah. Man, the guy who studies that must be rolling in pee. Yeah, well, actually, I mean, plants don't mate that way, and they only roll in what they study, so I imagine they're rolling in a lot of pollen. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. P for pollen. That's, what, that's why I left <laughs> it ambiguous. Right, fair enough. Uh, indeed, this is a pretty obscure science, however... Interestingly, in the past 10 years or so, that obscure science has become very, very important because all of a sudden, algology, which, you know, for the longest time was just this obscure science that seemed to have no real importance, it now really does because the future might be in the hands of those algologists or phycologists, depending on what they call themselves. You see, we are now finding that algae can be essentially genetically engineered to produce biofuels, meaning we can have these giant mass of algae that essentially make us diesel fuel. And that means that you can grow fuel the same way you now can grow corn or a different kind of crop. You could do that with fuel. You could do that with fuel just with this algae. And because algae reproduce quite quickly and there's not a lot to take care of with them, that could be a huge source of energy in the future. And it doesn't necessarily just need to be fuel. They could also be making the components of future foods that we use, including you know vegetable oil and that kind of stuff. We can genetically engineer these algae to produce these substances we desperately need. And it might be that that algae becomes the next cow or or sheep or pig or huge domesticated animal that's that changed the way we live. It could be that algae becomes the domesticated plant that changes the way we live. But unlike corn or rice or, or wheat, it does so not necessarily just producing food, but producing food, fuel, energy, everything that we need as a modern society to function. Taking a step back, you're right. The joke was right in front of me, but I uh-huh. think you went the wrong way with algology being Al Borland. Right. I think you go with Al Gore. It's right there. Oh, that's a good one. And then it would be the study of inventing the internet. Oh, that is true. That's very, very good. Look at the field of algology for some very interesting progress in the next few years because we're going to see things like, you know, cars being run on the fuel that comes out of algae and these giant algae mats maybe being the basis by which we feed the next two billion people that come into this world in the next few decades. As algology becomes um, part of big energy, will algologists in general start to deny climate change? Well, no, they they would become shills. No, because this algae would be pulling carbon out of the atmosphere to then release it later on, but it would essentially be a carbon neutral process, so they wouldn't actually be creating more carbon. So they would still be on the right side of history and science in terms of admitting the issue with carbon and our climate. Tell that to Middle America. And speaking of Middle America, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy, and with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm doing great, if not a little lonely. Yeah, uh, the studio feels a little lonely because yeah, where, our, where the fuck's our scientists? we don't have our scientists for the evening because we have chosen two archaeology articles as our main articles. And so I will put on my scientist hat today and be not only your scientist slash comedian host, but also just the scientists themselves as we speak about the articles. Uh, just so you know, this was an archaeology week. It was well established mm-hmm. w- long before this. Right. Uh, so in preparation so that Bobby didn't have to do both the hosting and... Uh, and the scientists, the situation we find ourselves in now, 
I went to UCSD and asked every archaeologist I could find if they would, <laughs> and then they were they all seemed super into it until they found out the name of the podcast. Right. Once they found out they were going to be the archaeologists and science faction, two of them actually peed themselves and ran away. Okay, are you saying because they're scared about? I, I am saying that words on the street is you don't if you're an archaeologist stay the fuck away from this show. Yeah, I do do a lot of I'm, I'm kind of like a protection racket. Anytime there's another archaeologist guy, I just come and bend their trowels and then punch through their their dirt screens. You're the archaeologist bully. Yeah, I am. I, I am Biff, the archaeologist bully. <laughs> Always giving noogies to other. Jerk thinks he's going to drown. This is why no one came to Bobby's birthday party. <laughs> Get your damn hands off her, Bobby. <laughs> also, by the way, right now you, you're in command of this of this podcast. You're mm-hmm. the host. Right. But, you know, heavy is the head that wears the crown. I, I don't feel like you should ser- serve two very important masters, the one of the scientists and of the host. I feel like I should take over the hosting duties no, for this yeah, episode. And I don't think that would work well. Uh, you're the comedian. You already have trouble with that particular aspect. So because I don't I'm know always that... thinking of sweetie hosting lines. No, I, that's not why you're doing it at all. No, I think you should stick to trying to make the the ha ha funnies. You let me take care of uh, uh, the science and the hosting parts. You're, you're you're a pregnant woman and you're picking up a ten gallon water jug and you're looking at me like I'm the asshole for wanting to help out. Uh, we also want to extend a thanks out to all of our new listeners. We know we've had an uptick in the last week we see you guys in the numbers and we thank you so much for joining us hopefully you like it stick around subscribe and leave a comment on itunes and especially if you guys are new listeners you might not be aware that any questions you have about a particular article you can go ahead and check out these articles as well as some we don't get to at our website www.thesciencefaction.com but for now let's move right on to science articles god damn it from molecules to particles this is is science articles. All right, article number one. Hominids made it to China way earlier than previously thought. This is a super interesting article because it looks like we have just found the oldest evidence of hominids outside of Africa. Now, you're saying hominid. Uh-huh. That's just another word for human, right? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, what do you mean? What species was, was found? We, well, we don't know because we don't know the species. We've only found their material remains, so the tools that they made. So it could have been time travelers no always. no not time travelers it was just it was a hominid most likely homo erectus now as we've discussed before on this show human beings evolved within africa hominids evolved within africa and then they radiated out now we have evidence of homo erectus in Demonisi, georgia the shitty country not the shitty state is it true that the way you tell the difference between a skeleton found mm-hmm. in each one is if uh, well, there's a few signs. First off, is there evidence of lip tobacco currently in the skeleton? And that would be shitty state Georgia, not shitty country. Is it buried under a pickup truck? Yeah, also shitty state Georgia, not shitty co- I feel like shitty country Georgia is just like, it's a lot of really dirty white people dressed in 1980s clothing and still playing cassette tapes. Like, I feel like that's that's Georgia, Georgia. Miami Vice, number one. <laughs> So, Demonisi, Georgia, not that far away from Africa, so you're still looking in that that kind of general region, up until now held the oldest remains of hominids outside of Africa, and that dated to about 1.8 to 1.9 million years ago. Again, this is Homo erectus. It's not our own species, which evolved later, again, all the way back in Africa. But these guys ventured out of Africa, and they went around Eurasia and, you know, occupied quite a bit of that all the way down into the Javanese Islands eventually. However, we just found... 2.1 2.1 million year old stone tools in a site in China. So this is pretty far away. And like a, it, like a stone miter saw. Yeah, yeah. So it was a stone laptop for one. <laughs> it looked like it was just a ripoff of an American stone laptop, though. But it was connected to a very advanced 3D printer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These tools are indicative of hominids. They're flake stone lithics. And we see them in the record. Now, we don't know who did this. We don't know if it was Homo erectus. Maybe it was some version of Homo habilis. Maybe it was a hominid that we haven't discovered yet. But we do know that it was a hominid that made these tools, because we're the only ones who make these type of tools. And that hominid undoubtedly came, like all hominids do, from Africa. So a long time before we previously thought, hominids had migrated out of that continent quite far. Because Demonisi, Georgia, isn't a huge leap. When you look at it on a map, you can go, okay, I can see somebody getting there from Africa pretty easily. But China? That's a long way. That means that they probably left much longer than 2.1 million years ago. If we find them in China at that point, it means they had to leave some time before that in order to make it there and leave those stone tools. We've established on this show that we humans in our history fuck anything. Yes. And we've also discussed on this show that 
in China, there is one unknown hominid that, mm-hmm. like, you know, Europeans made it with Neanderthals. Right. Uh, Somewhere in Asia, there is a, a hominid that he, that Homo sapiens made it with because their DNA is found, but we don't know. We don't know. We've never found their bones. We don't know who they are. Is it possible that the people of China were banging this? 2.1 million year old gangster OG yeah. Homo erectus P. I guess I could see that happening because there is a mysterious ancestor in the record over there. It could also be... The Yeti. No, it wasn't a Yeti. I mean, <laughs> this is just a different hominid, likely a Homo erectus descendant. This could be the progenitor or somehow related to whatever hominid that we later banged in East Asia that, I, that contributed to part of our DNA spectrum. It could be a lost hominid that ended up dying out. It could be something that later evolved into what we see in like Java Man and some of the other Homo erectus fossils in Southeast Asia. We don't know. We haven't even found the bones of this creature yet. So what you're saying as an archaeologist, uh-huh. a person who studies dinosaurs, God damn it. that you guys have not found evidence of a hominid somewhere in the greater China area that just got into wrecks everywhere it operated a vehicle. Yeah, well, um, I mean, that's probably why they went extinct, is that their <laughs> ability to both drive and park competently was incredibly hindered. Are those are hazard lights? <laughs> So the site is pretty interesting. They were able to date it using a technique where you actually measure the alignment of iron molecules within the the soil and the iron-containing elements within the soil because, as we've discussed a few times, the Earth's magnetic field actually flips. And depending on where it is at any given time, we have a general idea of when the soil and strata was laid down because the iron molecules are lined up with the Earth's magnetic field at that time. They use that magnetic field alignment to determine that it was at least 1.9 to 2 something million years ago. And so we're not 100% sure on the exact dating, but we know it's at least that old. That gives us a pretty good benchmark, and then we kind of go, okay, it's this far deeper than that. We think it's around 2.1. So these dates aren't exact, but there is a limit, and that limit would still be before the Demonisi fossils, meaning that we definitely now know the oldest known occupation outside of Africa isn't right next door in Demonisi, Georgia, or right next door in Saudi Arabia, where we also have some old stuff. It's all the way in China. Going back a sec, aren't aren't we due for another flip of the magnetic? Yeah, yeah. Poles? At at some point, sometime soon, likely, give or take a hundred thousand years. Yeah, we will have one. But you know, when we say soon, soon in geological time can be like half the length lifetime of our species. So okay, but when that happens, does that mean that we'll be the upside down ones and Australia will be right side up? Yes, that's exactly what will happen. Okay, uh, good. My model of the universe stands correct. Yeah, Australia will be right side up, so to speak, <laughs> which means that everybody there will not have to walk on their hands anymore. Which would be great for them will boomerangs turn the other way boomerangs will turn the other way toilets will spin the other way See, everybody will know what a fucking knife is <laughs> and uh we will be the one who needlessly add r's to the end of words that end in a how about that that is <laughs> that's the way it'll work and the aborigines will discriminate against the whites that's exactly that? yep that, exactly because this exodus is so old we can't say for sure that this is homo erectus the age could be Homo habilis, which is a much smaller, much more primitive species. It could be a whole different one that we don't know of. It could be one that wandered in and had a speciation event within Asia and became its own species there. So there is some interesting mysteries here that still need to be unraveled. I'd like to see some wide-scale excavation near the site to see if we can't find some fossils of the actual bones themselves. We don't know the preservation environment. Uh, you know, if it was wet and stuff, it's unlikely you will find bone fossils. But maybe we'll end up figuring out exactly what this is at some point in the future. Very interesting article. Moving on to article number two. No, no, Texas no. Texas tools? God damn it. All right, yes, on to article number two. Uh, Let me help you. Speaking of old archaeology stuff, it looks like we might have found the oldest evidence of occupation of the Western Hemisphere. Very, very cool stuff. Again, we keep pushing back the date of the occupation of the Americas over and over again. We keep finding older and older sites. We know, again, as a general primer for those who don't know, we know that the history of the natives of North and South America basically start in a place called Beringia, which is now underwater in between Alaska and Russia. And that particular place was a, at that point, continent that was above ground, but it no longer is. It's now underwater. And people coalesce there for a few thousand years. They develop their own culture, their own kind of genetic lineage. And then eventually those people migrated in to the Americas, creating all of the natives of North and South America. So am I to understand that being a continent, Mm -hmm. Beringia is the exact opposite of me being incontinent? 
No, no, not at all. <laughs> you being incontinent is just an unfortunate diagnosis <laughs> for you and, quite frankly, the show. But <laughs> we all have to be in the room with you. Yeah, well, I mean, I thank you for lining the seats in plastic. Right. This is really interesting because this is a long-known site uh, called the Buttermilk Creek site or the Galt site in Texas, about 40 miles north of Austin. And we've known for a long time that they have some early occupation stuff, some pre-Clovis stuff at like 13.5 or something the, the like Galt that. The Galt site? Was there some Anne Rand fans there, discovering yes, some I, stuff? It's spelled slightly differently, but I thought the same thing, given that it's in Texas. <laughs> so they were looking through this st stone tool assemblage that looks, by the way, almost like continuous occupation from all the way back then. And they, they have stuff from the late prehistoric, which is the most recent, the archaic, which is just after that, the Paleo-Indian, which goes back to like 13,000, Clovis, which goes back to like 13,500, and then the pre-Clovis stuff. And it looks like some of their pre-Clovis assemblage is somewhere between 16,000 to 21,000 years old. That 16,000 would be pretty much the oldest confirmed date of a absolutely confirmed stone tool or other artifact though we do have some stuff that might be older. That is the absolute oldest confirmed date. And that's only the low end of the spectrum. Some of this stuff could be 20,000 years old, which is kind of when we think the natives did make it from Beringia into North America. Now, did we know it was Texas? Like, for example, were the stone tools something like a holster? Yeah, yeah, there was, was truck it, nuts chipped yeah, out of Flint. Ten-gallon hat. Was it an epitaph, the hating on Mexicans? Yeah. Were a people who had yet to exist? Yeah, but that hate goes deep. <laughs> They used an optical luminescence method of dating, which is basically measuring when the last time a specific quartz crystal or something like it was exposed to light. That's a good general way to tell how old the site is because it's at least giving you some boundary layer. Now, it could be much older because it could have been laying on the surface for a long time exposed to light after it was made, but it tells you it was covered up at least that long ago, which means it had to be made before that, obviously. So assuming that the dating was done properly, that is a pretty solid dating method to use. I wanted to ask our scientist, um, which is me today. Yeah, this is why I don't feel like I'm going to get like an accurate answer. Okay, I feel like you're going to pretend to be much more competent in mm -hmm. this. But how accurate are your dating techniques? Do you subscribe to the game? <laughs> yeah, and do, do you neg? Yeah, like I said, pretty accurate. The range of difference is about a thousand years, give or take. So. That would be really, really old. Some of our oldest stuff is like, you know, we have Trace Ventanas down in South America. We have the Meadowcraft Rock Shelter in Pennsylvania. We have the Oregon Coprolites, the, the Paisley Caves in Oregon, the Skull in Tulum, Mexico. All of those are in the somewhere between 14,000 to 15 some odd thousand year old range. There are some hints that some of these things might be 16, 17,000 years old or older, but none of those have been solidly confirmed. This is pretty much the most solidly confirmed oldest date of artifacts in the Americas. Now, I know you tried to slip by poop as evidence. Uh -huh. past, yes. Past everybody. Yes, the copper lights, the, the yeah, Paisley the old... Caves in Oregon, 14,900 okay. years old. And that's the only evidence that there was a human occupation was these copper lights? There, at that specific spot, yes. Okay. How do you know they were human? You can tell How human do you know poo. it wasn't a bear shitting in the woods? Damien, if I have to explain to you what human poo tastes like one more time. <laughs> well, if it's a copper lad, I imagine it tastes like shattered teeth. <laughs> so these would be the direct ancestors of basically all Native Americans because the date is so old that this is still before the separation between North American natives and South American natives. So these individuals in Texas, the ones that made these tools, would likely be somehow related to all native groups of both continents. That's super interesting. This site is super interesting. It had an appeal to anybody living in that area because it had a year-round stream that kept going even in drought times and a source of good quality flint, or a, a, which is a stone that you can make good tools out of very nearby. And so it looks like it was continuously occupied almost from 16,000 plus years ago to today. That's amazing, having that amount of depth, that stratigraphy, and those different layers of site occupation that go all the way back. It means this is a really good spot to live if you're in the Paleolithic era. I just don't like how cocky Texas archaeological spots are. You know, like they actually oh, have, have the best archaeological sp spots in the country mm -hmm. when they ignore all the problems. They ignore that they convict babies. Now, what was interesting to me as an archaeologist who likes lithics, the, some of their stone tools were interesting. Their projectile points were smaller than the stuff we later see in Clovis and the Paleo-Indian period, which is really interesting because usually back then they were hunting megafauna and we see a lot of really big points. And then we see a, a trend towards smaller points in the archaic and late prehistoric. So seeing way, 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 way back, the oldest stuff also had small points is a very interesting thing and very surprising, not something we would expect. 
You mentioned a bit ago about a point when the natives of North America and the natives of South America separated. Uh Uh-huh. Do you think there was a point, you know, like as man just kept spreading, you know, and they, they, they spread out east to the east coast and they spread down south down yeah. into Mexico. And then there was a point where they kind of hit the rainforest. They go like, all right, well, I guess you got to go start a new tribe in there. Yeah. And do you think like after like 10 nights in the rainforest, they came back out and said, are you sure there's no more room? We can't, we can't argue some hunting ground back We don't up north. have bug spray, guys. <laughs> and this is, mm, this is pretty bad. It is terrible down there. Everything will kill you. Yeah, but at least there's a lot of food and there's pretty colors. I mean. Is it because there's like a desert straight up north? So like, yeah, uh, can't be that much worse. Yeah, exactly. Well, it, I mean, a lot of our models do show that you can occupy these continents in a very short amount of time with it just, you know, moving a few miles downstream and starting your new clan. It doesn't take that long, surprisingly enough. So we think that the continents were both occupied pretty quickly, and a lot of the sites reflect that. But what is interesting about this article is that we have to continually do the same dance that we've talked about a thousand times. The worm. No, not the worm. This thing where every time an article is written about an ancient American site, they always go, well, this site is making scientists rethink this Clovis first hypothesis. Let me break this down. A long time ago, i.e. 30 to 50 years ago, we thought the first people in the Americas were these Clovis people, and we call them that based on a tool technology that was found outside of Clovis, New Mexico. It's basically fluted points, not to get too specific. It's a very particular type of, of tool. We found this throughout very, very early sites in the United States. However, we have been finding pre-Clovis sites for the past 20 plus years. There hasn't been a Clovis first, so to speak, or the idea that Clovis people were the first people here. There hasn't been a Clovis first archaeologist anywhere in American archaeology in, I don't know, 15 years. Yet every single time a site comes up, an old site, we have to rethink Clovis first. We have to address this disagreement in archaeology between Clovis first and pre-Clovis people. That does not exist, and I don't know how it keeps getting repeated. It is like a bad joke that constantly goes around but doesn't make any sense. Clovis first sounds like a chant amongst nationalists within the Clovis society. Right. Clovis first! We're tired of these pre-Clovis immigrants taking their jobs. Right, it's a bunch of people from Clovis, New Mexico, screaming at Mexicans. <laughs> Clovis first! Wow, this is, this is just part of the land. But yes, the site itself is super interesting. The article is super interesting. It almost skips over the fact that it's essentially the oldest evidence that we, co- we solidly have dated for human occupation of North America and just jumps to the stupid argument about Clovis first or non-Clovis first. Every time you see that, I, I want you to get on the comment boards and just say, nobody's a Clovis first archaeologist. This doesn't exist. Stop falsely creating tension for your articles by pretending there's some kind of disagreement that doesn't actually exist between scientists. Well, I think people are as unlikely to do that, what you said, jump onto an archaeologist archaeology message board as they are to jump onto an algology message board right because you guys are both bottom of the barrel science god damn it all right and nobody's interested in let's that. let's move on to our favorite bit ask bobby an ungoogleable question all right this is an interesting ungoogleable question that we got uh this one by email i i have one question as the host uh-huh. um, since, you're not since, the host since, but go since, ahead since this bit is set up around asking the host a question uh-huh. and i've kind of assumed at least 50 percent of sure. the hosting responsibilities does that mean that um, my answer will carry as much, if not more, weight than yours? Well, I'll tell you what, Damien. Uh, I am egalitarian, so good answers. Will... Are you? Yes, I, I am. Very, very. And uh, good answers is what will carry the weight. So, uh, no. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Okay, I brought it to the board. All right. So this Google, ungoogleable question comes to us from email. If you want to ask one, you can always tweet us at Faction Science, or you can send us an email through our website, www.thesciencefaction.com. Question. What one idea or concept has the most potential to improve the world if a significant amount of people adopted it? I think this is a great question. Very interesting, very well thought out. Broad, but can be narrowed down in oddly specific terms. Damien, did you want to take a shot at this? Yes. Okay. I mean, I don't want my answer here to discount any joke answers might mm-hmm. have in the future. Sure. But you wouldn't I, want that to happen. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I think each of my joke answers should be weighted individually. Uh-huh. And- By humor. In another case, like you said below, bottom of the barrel. <laughs> You can weigh it by its humor or scientific validity, whichever is slightly higher. Yeah, you're, al- you're the algologist of comedian. I invented the internet? <laughs> okay, this one's going to sound like a joke, but I, uh, it's only a 25% joke. Okay. It it's is like most of them. Mock stupidity. If, oh, that somebody should mock yeah, stupid and, and, people. And not just like one, one or two people who are mm-hmm. brave enough to mock the person, but like I need like society to okay. stand up. So more, so more stupid shaming is what you think. Yes. Yeah, so like... When that idiot from your high school class starts saying that GMOs aren't real or that uh-huh. 9-11 was an inside job or posts an Alex Jones video, 
I need not just one or two brave individuals to shame this man. Right. I need a community. It takes a village to destroy a human. <laughs> So your idea is that we just need um we need to make fun of him more. I think you might give him like a persecution complex at that point. Good. And they, and no, but then they might double down and think they're all the more right. Like all these people are coming after me. I'm Jesus. I'm the right one. Okay, but that's some percentage of it. But a lot of people hate being mocked and will alter their view. That's true. I would like to say, by the way, when we said what idea has the most potential to change the world, and you said mock stupidity, I misinterpreted that from the moment. I thought you meant pretend to be stupid. Like, you mock like you're an idiot. Like, the way to save the world is just whenever anybody asks you, like, a math question, you just defecate. Like, that's yeah. the way we will make the world a better place. That's how I got through math class. That's it. it is, and that's the incontinence we spoke of earlier. You have to understand, Nell was really big at the time. Yeah. I also muttered a lot of nonsense. Yes, mocking stupidity. It's not a horrible answer. I thought of a few myself, so I'm, I'm going to go through them kind of one by one. I tried to look for things that had supportable, realistic evidence for them that we could look at in a scientific fashion. The first would be the idea of pacifism, uh, nonviolence, or the uh, right of all people to bodily autonomy. So the idea that nobody has the right to take away somebody else's bodily autonomy, hurt another person, unless... It is to keep themselves alive, unless that person is actively engaging in some kind of activity that is causing damage to the first person. Unless you are an officer of the law and you feel threatened for your life. That is true. Because you're choking them, but you never know when their neck is going to really violently attack your arms, and so you have to keep choking harder. Exactly. So there's the idea of not harming anybody. I think pacifism on a wide scale would greatly improve the world. If all of a sudden people stopped actively committing acts of violence against one another and countries stopped doing the same... And we respected each person's individual right to be free of that violence. Our society would undoubtedly be measures, like measures of amplitude better than it is now. We would have a place that we wouldn't have to have as many police officers. We wouldn't have to have as many jails. We wouldn't have to have a lot of the, I mean, just think of like the defense industry when it comes to weapons or guns or anything. You would have no need for any of that stuff. If everybody took it as a moral imperative to not harm other people, to not cause physical transgressions against them, the world would be a much better place. So that is in the contention, is that kind of pacifism. Like Southern governors and, and sheriffs be like, well, what could we criminalize? That's right. The next one, the idea of environmental protection and pollution control. Obviously, right now, our biggest problem right now is probably is our runaway climate change, but not just climate change itself. We talked about how pollution kills almost 5 million people a year last week. That's a huge deal. So any kind of land stewardship, taking care of nature, preventing mass pollution would help not only the world in the long term, not having sea level rises, but the people in the short term not dying from pollution elements and just the everyday life because you are not walking through air that's super dirty. If you were in Beijing, you'd have to wear a mask just so you don't breathe in all the particulate matter. Being able to live in a world that is fairly clean and free of those type of very dangerous and harmful pollutants would be great. The, the world would be an infinitely better place if we did that. So that's in the running. But I mean, couldn't you argue that all those pollutants are a check against our unchecked population growth? Yeah, so they are killing off some people. That's right. I would rather not kill off random people uh, and then instead just have less people to start off Listen, with. Listen, I'm a Thanos fan, man. It needs Our, our killing needs to be uh, dispassionate and random. Well, it brings up one of the other ideas, which is the idea of population control. So if we as a society or as a world society adopted the idea that you couldn't have more than two children, you couldn't, just, couldn't do more than just replace yourself, and ideally you would have less so that we are population declines over time, we would be in a much better state. I mean, the state currently of the world is only such because we are overpopulated. If you took out that overpopulation, we would not be able to have wars or famine or anything else. Here's a great example. Imagine all the resources we currently have, the houses, the land, the money, the cars, all that stuff. Cut the population in one third, right? Now, all of a sudden, you have the exact same amount of resources, but they only go to a third as many people. You can keep playing that game and keep cutting that down and down until we're, there's 100,000, you know, world oligarchs, so to speak, and we all live very plush, lavish lifestyles and don't have to worry about depleting the oceans or the forests and taking up a lot of land, the less people in general, the better quality of life for each of those people. So if we took upon ourselves as a world nation the idea of birth control and planning our future families and all that kind of stuff, if you took all of that into account and you stopped having too many kids, then you would have a much better world. But if you did that, then our species would never know the simple joy of raising a baby at 16. That's true. Or of Larry the Cable Guy specials. Get her done. <laughs> then I think there are things that are pretty paramount to kind of our Western culture idea, but they are kind of in some ways universal goods. And so I will say something like freedom of speech. 
if everybody adopted a very strict version of freedom of speech, everybody has the right to say what they want, and nobody should be physically harmed for it, you can be held accountable for it, but that doesn't mean that you are going to face violence or repercussions. There are massive parts of this world in which if you say something bad about the person in charge, you and your family show up dead the next day. That is not as uncommon as we in the West like to believe. If you can propagate that idea of freedom of speech, all information gets to you from somewhere else. If you need to get that information, the best possible way to do so is to have a system by which that information is open to everybody, including yourself, with the lowest barrier of entry. The only way to make that happen is some kind of broad-spectrum freedom of speech that keeps people from being restricted by either libel laws or uh, oppressive governments or regimes or even just uh, oppressive cultures that shout down people. If we can make freedom of speech a paramount right throughout the world and actually enforce that paramount right, it would make the world a much better place. I'm all for freedom of speech, but then occasionally you meet a dictator in life, somebody mm -hmm. who likes to rewrite history. And say things like Damien's never won a game if I call BS. Yeah, I mean sometimes you're right. Sometimes the they, sometimes they say true things. You're correct. Even dictators will say true things, like how you have not won, I call BS. Factually false. You know what, fans, if you hear an episode where I've won, they're not that hard to find, but mm -hmm. we encourage you to go listen to our episode of Libraries. Please tweet Bobby a big fuck you. <laughs> so that's one. I personally was leaning towards my number one being just the idea of skepticism in general. So skepticism being a belief... Aliens exist. <laughs> well, the bill. Wanting evidence for your beliefs, holding evidence as the paramount relationship to truth, believing things when you have enough evidence, and changing those beliefs when the evidence is to the contrary, and basically comporting your worldview to reality. If you do that, you are much likely to find out true things, to treat people more fairly, to not be tricked by things that would cause you to treat people unfairly, uh, to look at things like science as a tool to know the world as opposed to mythologies as a tool to know the world. And in general, I think skepticism broadly leads to much, much better lifestyles for everybody who uses it. It keeps you from falling from stupid things. It keeps you from being trapped in lifestyles that you know you don't want. There are a lot of people who are raised religious and they... For forced to go home every day to a wife dreaming about that sweet D on the coworker that they saw. That's right. Well, there's a, there's, there's a lot of people who are raised in a religion. They at some point start finding a bunch of contradictory evidence. They find it hard to believe, but because they don't have the mindset of a skeptic that believes that it's a good thing to question those beliefs and go and find flaws in it and change your perspectives, they will continue believing in a cognitive dissonance where they know that what they're saying is BS, and that creates an unbalanced and, you know, usually not very happy person. I, I, got, I got trapped on that previous train, you know, that, that person I was describing. I come home every day to my wife, Michelle Bachman. Mm-hmm. Just a proud heterosexual man ready to engage in intercourse with his hot congressman of a wife. So I was thinking skepticism, because skepticism leads you to a lot of those things, including uh, belief in free speech and uh, things like the, the knowledge of what you need to do for population control and all, and all these other ideas. But I will say something that is nagging on me as I've been considering this question that I think is actually very important, because it's one of the hardest things for me personally to accept, and it is one of the things that is most backed by science, especially neuroscience is the idea of free will being an illusion. So this is a really popular idea in a lot of skeptic circles because of the evidence from neuro, uh, neuroscience, which show us that we don't necessarily have free will. And if you take it from a philosophical standpoint, in some ways can't. So you're born with a certain brain. That's your hardware. Some of that brain stuff is already hardwired in, uh, fear of heights, that kind of stuff. That could be your firmware. Then you get software upgrades throughout your life. You constantly learn new things. You adapt new software. Those three things go together. To... Uh oh, somebody upload the uncle molested virus. Yeah, oh, this, that happens too often. Yeah. And those three things kind of mix around in your head to help you make decisions. So when your decision comes to you, it's not like there's some magic that goes on in your head. Your, your head's a, a computer. You process the information. You spit out the result. It is a result of your innate nature and what you've been raised to do. And it just kind of happens. We then ad hoc, we go back and we justify why we made that decision by creating a story. And that story is what we call free will. So we can see this in neurobiology. We, we can ask somebody a question and we can watch their brain make the decision. And then later they decide why they made that decision. And that's what we call, you know, free will. It, it is later on adding on an element of decision making to something that's 
actually pretty innate. Those teachers, man, they just didn't get me. You know, like if anything, I should have been teaching in the class. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot like that. <laughs> uh, a lot like that kind of justification. We see this in split brain patients where we cut the corpus callosum. The brains can't talk to each other. You tell one side of the brain to do something. The other brain, side of the brain doesn't know why you did it. So when you then ask that other side of the brain, hey, why'd you do that? It will make up an excuse. It turns out that that's what our brain does for pretty much everything. We act based on the way our brain chemistry works, essentially, and then later go back and say, this is why I did it. What if your two halves of your brain just are, aren't even close to being on the same page? You know, like... Um, well, normally they talk to each other so that they always are. Like, like why'd you do that? Uh, Satan made me do it. Yeah, well, like, the explanations they give can be that ridiculous. So the idea of, of free will, the illusion of it, presents a lot of problems because it makes us be much more punishment oriented in terms of changing people's behavior when that might not necessarily be the best way to change people's behavior. It allows us to put blame on everything and that might not always be the best case, especially if it's not the way we work. If our brains are just reacting in a certain way and then rationalizing it later, then blame isn't as useful as understanding how our brains are reacting, when they're reacting, and how to change that reaction. So not only that, but it prevents... You're invalidating most of Judge Dredd's proud <laughs> career as a public safety officer. Well, and it prevents us from understanding our own true motivations. You know, if you keep insisting you have free will when you don't and saying the reason you perform a certain action is whatever ad hoc explanation you come up with afterwards, then you're never going to be able to change that actual behavior. The only way to do so is to admit what that behavior actually is and then, you know, use whether, whether it's neurobiology or cognitive behavioral therapy or just different tactics and, and tricks, find a way to fix the actual problem and change the way your neural processing works, not constantly imagine that you have some free will that allows you to dictate it. I agree with you that you can't change. <laughs> However, that's not to say that you can't fix this problem. I think if you hired somebody to fix it for you, mm -hmm. be it, uh, think of a Hannibal Lecter type, okay. a Buffalo Bill type, or even just a Marine drill sergeant that we've talked about, somebody to go in there and rewire this code. Yeah. Break well, you down. And that is a good way to do it. Sometimes you need to be rewired by somebody else. It's not a bad idea. Which is why I'm going to make some changes as host of this show, because I've noticed some flaws and some things yeah. personally I'd like changed about you as a person okay. and the way you conduct science. Uh, you're not the host, and no, those flaws don't exist. All right. <laughs> uh, that is kind of uh, the overall thing. Those are my final answers. I don't think any one of those would do it on its own, but I think some kind of amalgam of that does really lead to a better world. Now, how you get everybody to accept that and go along with it is essentially the impossible question because nobody ever would. But if you add the entire world on the same page with any one of those things, it would be better, and with all of those things, it would be paradise. So... I don't know. Spread those ideas. Here's one idea to make paradise. I'd like to change the way we collectively as a society, as a mm -hmm. people, as a species, viewed sweating. I would love it, mm -hmm. personally, if highly sweaty individuals, I yeah. mean, perhaps like myself, yeah. uh, if that was looked at as, as an aphrodisiac, if that was looked at as a sign of virility. Yeah, it never will and, be. It never will be. Um, you just look really sickly. <laughs> yeah, also, I mean, if you think about it, as long as we're changing the way society works, if you change the term win to the term loss, you could finally win a game of I Call BS. In your crazy opposite world, I have lost several games. <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks so much for joining us for Science Faction 241, where you learned about algology, how we found the oldest evidence of hominids outside of Africa, the oldest confirmed evidence of the peopling of the new world, and what concept or idea has the most potential to improve the world if adopted by a significant amount of people. Thank you so much for joining us, and tune in this Thursday for a very special I Call BS where Damien can put his chops to the test against our guest scientist. Thank That's you. you. Thank you so much for joining us, and come on back this Thursday for Science Faction 242. You'll have the answers right in front of you. You've been listening to Science Faction. Wait. That's not right.